Thank you, Anne, for agreeing to be interviewed and you gave a really nice talk today. So, um, maybe please just give us a brief overview on what the current um, scope of HIV vaccines are, both active and passive immunization. So, the HVTN has focused a lot on trying to address both of these uh, types of vaccination strategies. Mm -hmm. So, we currently have two really large efficacy trials involving over 8,000 participants that are happening in Africa and mm -hmm. in the Americas where uh, using passive immunization, we're using a monoclonal antibody um, that's being infused into people to determine what levels of um, these antibodies are required to protect against um, HIV infection. And mm -hmm. even though this is not a public health strategy that would be easily to implement, I think we're really going to learn a lot. And just by knowing what levels are required, it can really address whether we can move into subcutaneous or, or intramuscular vaccinations. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, currently our <coughs> passive um, strategies. In terms, of, in terms of active, a lot of the work that we're doing is focused on T cells um, and generating T cells that can help B cells to make uh, broadly neutralizing antibodies. And we have uh, 702, which is a very big efficacy trial that's currently going on, where um, it's, a, it's a continuation of the RV144 trial. Um, so in terms of what that trial had shown was a 31% efficacy. Mm -hmm. And it was then a, the same vaccine regimen was tried in South Africa and women. And there we were able to show that it, it was as immunogenic and safe in a South African subpopulation. Then based on that data, we adapted it to a sub C population. So the RV144 was subtype B and E, and now we've adapted to KC envelope. And on top of that, we've adjusted the adjuvant. So in the RV145, we use alum, and in HVTN100, we're using MF59, as it's been shown to increase T cell responses, but also by doing so, you can reduce how much product you're being, you can use in these trials, which is really important given the limitations around manufacturing of the proteins for these vaccines. Mm -hmm. So we're really trying to tackle many different aspects that we think are important for um, a successful HIV vaccine um, where there's very little known about how to generate these immune responses. Okay, so for the passive immunization, if it works, so is the plan to then re-engineer the antibodies in well, much easier formulation that can be easily administered that don't require an actual intravenous. Exactly. So if we, we can figure out what the levels are, we'll try to do it intramuscular or intradermally. Mm -hmm. We've already started some adaptations where, for example, we have a longer lasting one. It's called VRCO1LS, and that's also being trialed where we know these uh, antibodies will stay longer and hopefully then can be given um, subcutaneously. Okay. Yeah. So, um, a uh, majority of those antibodies, were they discovered in um, sub-Saharan populations or they were discovered around the world? There's, there's a few that have been discovered in sub-Saharan Africa and I'd say maybe most of them, but there are others from other uh, cohorts. So these have been isolated from people who are HIV infected and they've mm -hmm. since developed. And one of the great things about that is because they come, there's also some from other um, cohorts that are not in Africa, we're thinking of combinations where we're not just going to give one antibody because that also can push we yeah. get resistance. So we'll look at combining from the different cohorts to be able to cover a wide range of these um, infections around the world. Okay, and these antibodies are they broadly neutralizing? Do they um, are they involved in ADCC or is it a more holistic approach? Yeah, what they can do. So it's a it is a more holistic approach. We're trying to like get the best out of everything. So. Uh, you know, VRCO1, VRCO7, PGT121, all have different mechanisms by which they work. So to try and get around every mechanism that we think HIV might be invading the immune system, we're doing different combinations of the different functions. Okay. So for your active immunization, you said that um, you're trying to induce T cells. So is it mostly CD8 and CD4? I think the, the community is still quite split on that. And initially, the driver suit... Um, induce CD8 because of the belief that the CD4s are the ones that are getting affected. Yeah. But I think more and more now people are appreciating that we want to drive CD4s, like so TFH as well, because yes. that goes into lymph node. And we feel like those are really important because they're going to interact with the B cells and those are the ones that are going to drive the B cells. So there is a huge drive for CD4 T cell development right now. Okay. And I think you show data for what the comparison for HVTN 144, you know, when you use the RV144 vaccine in sub-Saharan Africa before you actually um, change, it was changed to HBTN100, it induced really high CD4 responses as it well. Did. 
it did. So in both those trials, it was really high CD4 responses, hardly any CD8 T cell responses. And the nice thing about repeating that regimen in South Africa is besides showing once again that it was safe and immunogenic, the responses were very comparable between the two in terms of frequency. But in terms of the number of people responding, in South Africa, there was more people responding to the vaccine than there was in, in Thailand where it was designed for. So okay. that suggests that there is going to be hopefully a good response in sub-Saharan Africa to HV10-100 vaccine. Okay. And um, maybe you just describe some of the changes that were made to the vaccine regimen when you look at HVT, I mean, RV144 and HVTN100. So we basically kept the, the timing of the vaccinations the same way, mm -hmm. we're priming in the same way, we're boosting in the same way. The difference is we've taken up the arms that were specific to subtype B and subtype E, mm -hmm. and we've now inserted a clade C specific because the clade C is uh, dominant in sub-Saharan Africa. Okay. And then, like I mentioned, the adjuvant changes as well. Alum was changed for MF59 because of being able to dose spare, and it's been known to prime T cells better than um, alum does. Okay. Those are the major changes. And um, the paper, I think, was published, I think, in June or July. Mm -hmm. So did you see an induction of really good CD8 responses or was it predominantly CD4 and antibodies? It was predominantly CD4 and antibodies, yeah. So no, no, not really any CD8 T cell responses, okay. yeah, as predicted. And um, what may, um, what um, functional markers did you use to, de like, to determine it's a CD8 response? So in terms of CD8, it was very similar to what we do with CD4. You know, we had the CD4 markers, CD8 markers, and then we looked at multiple cytokines to look at whether maybe we we're missing something about the CDAs because we we're measuring only interferon gamma and OL2. Mm -hmm. That we included markers such as TNF, perforin, granzyme, um, and, and CD154, mm -hmm. and we really didn't see any activation of the CDA. Okay. okay. Um, thank you, Anne, for agreeing to be interviewed. Thank you, Chaleka.